Adam Miller, welcome to Australian Musician. Oh, thanks for having me, Greg. Stoked to be talking to you guys. Yeah. So how have you been uh, handling this isolation and uh, what have you been up to? Um, well, yeah, I've been just uh, focusing on playing and getting really good. Uh, it really did turn my life upside down. I was meant to be back at day, uh, and uh, my flight was basically a week after, well, let's say the first lockdown now. So I didn't get there and um, a lot of time to work on promoting this new album coming out and actually sort of do some things properly and, um, uh, yeah, just develop all sorts of different skills in the areas of uh, videoing and lighting and live streaming. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to go yeah. back for a little way. Um, when you were growing up and learning guitar, what were the albums that you sat and played along with? growing up okay well when i first started playing guitar and this is cool because i don't actually get to do australian interviews very often so people don't know what i'm talking about <laughs> um was actually craig mclaughlin's check one and check wow. one two album okay um uh so that was the i think the first song i learned on guitar was hey mona no uh, for those in the know um that album was actually filled with pretty good guitar stuff, so I think it was fun to play along to. So it was that um, and a 1927, like, Ish and The Other Side, those, and they were filled with really cool guitar things as well. Um, and then it wasn't long after that that I got Tommy Emanuel's Dare To Be Different album, and that sort of really changed everything to me, and mainly just because it was like, oh, wow, this guy doesn't sing. I sound exactly the same. Because, you know, when you're a kid and you're singing along, your voice hasn't nine or ten years old and you sound terrible. And I thought, oh, well, I sound exactly the same as him. So that was cool. And it sort of inspired that love of instrumental music and guitar stuff. And, yeah. yeah. So what were your hopes and dreams back then for a, for a music career? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I didn't really have any. Uh, I, I don't know, I loved doing it, but it was never... Like, uh, I didn't, I didn't really have these grand plans and dreams, you know, of, um, doing it as a career or as seriously as I ended up, it just sort of fell into it that way. And like, it's not to say that, so I was always playing this music that was difficult and, you know, but I guess through my teenage years, like in the nineties, like all the music going around was the whole grunge scene thing. And I remember, like in high school, none of my friends would let me be in their band because I was too good. They're like, oh, no, nah. we want we want someone that's not as good as you. Thank you. Till later where people started like being good enough to play like the Chili Peppers stuff and Rage Against the Machine and then the living end by the end that I started to get the call in and go, oh, yeah, you can play with us now because you're good enough to play. You can actually play that those things, whereas no one else could. So, yeah, yeah it was it was so it was, yeah, the you know, like the the dream of uh, being a musician didn't really take off till later, I'd say. OK, well, was there a local yeah. mus local music store where you'd go to check out gear and get your strings and picks and stuff? Uh, there were two, well, there are two great stores in town. The one I would always pretty much go to, uh, and ended up working at for a long time was, it was called Music Headquarters back in the day and it's called Jack's Music now. And then there's, um, Muso's Corner as well. And actually I remember the guitar that I still have from being a kid, uh, is a Les Paul studio that I actually got, um, when it was Brashes, the Brashes Network yeah. in Australia, um, I got that guitar there, I think, the day they closed down. So that was my, you know, my first amazing guitar score. As uh, I think uh, it was a bit, I think it was my 13th birthday present, that guitar, but it, we got it really cheap. It was like clearing the stocks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so fast forward to... Um, 2019 yeah uh, um uh you had uh several albums uh released and uh we're heading to america uh yeah. you you were uh, you actually relocated didn't you in 2019 
Yeah, the idea was um, I, I've actually been I'd been teaching at the university in Newcastle for the last ten years before that, so that sort of kept me going, um, surviving to an extent, and being able to tour and really pursue things around the world in between. Uh, and then that sort of closed up towards the end of 2018 with restructuring of courses and things. So, um, yeah, it was just why not just take it on for a while and see what happens. So that was that was really the plan. Um, I had shows throughout the US, like uh, already booked. Uh, so it was pretty chaotic because we sort of got there and it was shows and on the road straight away and, you know, like, it ended up we didn't even get a place because we were never in – while I was main, we were mainly in Los Angeles, it was only for like three weeks at a time at the most, and then it was back out on the road for two or three weeks. So, um, yeah, it was definitely a fun adventure to uh, live through that time. Yeah. Um, and you yeah. you basically found a band while you were there? You, you come across a couple of guys? Yeah, Definitely. Like I've always had a few guys in the U S that I play with, but, um, it just so happened at the start of last year that I just met the first time I'd actually even never heard their names before. These two great guys, we we're all similar age. Um, you know, very sort of varied back and, but similar at the same time. So, um, Justin Glasgow drummer who, um, his main thing now is actually producing and recording. He actually spends most of his time in his own studio doing a lot of that out of LA. Um, but he also um, was like, he's just played drums and bass on like huge hits over the years, which freaked me out. So he's just been a really in demand session guy. And then um, Joel Gottschalk, bass player who, uh, toured with Philip Sace for a long time. So, uh, and then sort of just later in, um, settled down a little bit, you know, had a kid in, in LA. So these guys were around, they were available, which was great too. Um, and we just got along well and they, yeah, musically, um, had so much, was so much on the same page at the same time. So yeah, they did most of my shows through the year and then we were able to, uh, head into, yeah, at the end of the year and get this album down. Yeah. Uh, the album is out later this week. It's called Unify. Um, yes. What's the significance of the title? <sighs> yeah, I've been thinking, it, it basically started that the title was all very negative connotations. I had sort of these scientific terms for moving and like, you know, shifting around things. And um, because I hadn't, actually finished the artwork at the start of the um pandemic and things i'm like oh the last thing i need to do is release an album title in this negative context so um yeah it, so yeah unify just sort of brought those things together in a different terms of like just you know bringing all my worlds into one in a way so um just having that positive influence from you know growing up in australia and all that has you know impacted on my music and then you know finally recording an album outside of australia in los angeles and new friends and you know just bringing different people together like even uh joel and justin who played they were friends and they jammed but they'd never actually played a show together before okay so it was so it was nice to bring them into a space and you know bring those guys closer as well so it was it's sort of just all that sort of thing and that's you know at the end of the day instrumental music is that you know, I, I'm hoping to that people leave it with a smile on their face and not <laughs> depressed. So, any any way I can, you know, convey a uh, convey a positive message, I will. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Adam Levy yeah. was the first single. Uh, yes. What is it about Adam's uh, playing, and and uh, why did you want to dedicate a song to him? Well, actually, it's funny because I just got a text message from Adam as well. <laughs> as you asked that question random um it's it was an accident to be honest like adam has been um well one a huge influence for many years like through his songwriting and his playing and then like the last eight or nine years we've been fairly good friends so um it was it started out as the song 
we played this jam together. There are all these sort of cool things in LA. I guess, um, you know, one of the things about overseas is that no one seems to get paid for like your local gig. Like it's one of the things that Australians take for granted that when you play in the corner of the bar, you actually leave with money at the end of the night. It's not where it should be, but it, you do. Whereas in the States, just no one gets paid anything for playing in the corner of the bar. It's all tips. And so a lot of the touring guys take advantage of it and do these like coffee shop jams. So that was, we did this one, it's at 11 in the morning on Thursdays and Adam and I played along with Shania Twain's guitar player, Joshua Ray Gooch and this great band. And we just, it was totally improvised. So everyone just started something. And that was it. There was no, there was no song. Um, and so Adam started this great chord progression and I sort of stole it later and just checked it wasn't something he was seriously working on. Um, and then just finished it through that. And it just had this working title as Adam Levy forever. And then after too long, it just stuck. And it was, it just, it does sort of personify who he is. And I, you know, I've stolen a lot of his songwriting cues and um, phrasing cues for the melody and he's, really beautiful ability to transition between like sort of pretty harmony to blues or, you know, very quickly. So I just stole all those things and yeah, it just had to be called Adam Levy at the end. Yeah. The yeah. second single is called shipping, uh, which is a lovely, yeah. lovely uh, sort of atmospheric building uh, groove. Um, yeah. Tell me about that track. Yeah. That track started, um, Inspired by a guitar that I was actually shipping off to a guy in America to get repaired. He was the builder of it. And in it getting shipped to him, it sustained more damage and got smashed even more, which is, you know, classic. I've been really lucky, actually. I've never, I've had guitars get lost for like two weeks, but they've always turned up in one piece. I'm, so far, that's this is the most damage I've had. So that made me pretty sad. So I was playing. Um, so that's where it sort of started at. And, um, yeah, just this idea of simplicity. And the first time I played it uh, was back in Australia, and I had um, Mitch Cairns on bass, who I've worked with for a long time. With, you know, he's really my best friend who's based in Melbourne. And um, I, I had this little chord progression, but I didn't. I ha and I had a melody in my head, but I couldn't play it yet, so I got Mitch to play it on bass, and that just sort of brought the whole thing. And because it was quiet, the you know the electric bass sort of takes on this almost cello context. So mm -hmm. I just sort of built it from there. And then um, so yeah, on the album it's got like the this acoustic acoustic arch top tone played at start, which is the guitar that got smashed. This Thorell guitar, then overdubbed with electric doubling the melody and some solos and then I sort of went crazy with um this like looping um random delay pedal thing called the chase bliss mood and I just got it I think the day I recorded that so I just went to town and recorded all these parts using it that and it just I didn't really know how it worked yet and I think that helped on that song yeah. what what were the guitars that you used on the album um the main ones were my uh Nick Hoover um Reed Bergen signature model, which is this one, this big guy here. So it's made of Californian redwood and has gold foils. And while it looks like a big 335, it's really, it sounds more like a giant telly is actually what it's meant to be. So, um, yeah, that's cool. And then there's a, a telly that I built from parts years ago, um, which has like Seymour Duncan pickups in it and a solid rosewood neck which was, I was pretty excited to find one of those. So I built this guitar and that's, um, that's been a fun friend forever. What do you know now about uh, recording guitars uh, that you, you didn't know the first time you walked into a studio? Uh, well, I, I actually record all my own stuff. So I've been super anal about it forever. And it's, um, I, I think the thing for me is I've just got more and more into pulling the sound before it gets recorded. Like I try to do nothing right. actually after it's recorded. So I just spend so much time making sure it's perfect 
before I hit record, which I probably spend too much time doing that. Um, yeah, I my you know I guess I do a few things that are sort of different to most people. Like I can't stand the sound of an SM57 on a guitar amp, so I'm I'm always using ribbons and condenser mics. Um, and I always have them a fair way back from the speaker, so they're like about a foot back, which sort of works, I guess, for what I do, is that I want to hear the air around it. You know, I don't want my ear next to the speaker when I listen back to it. I want it just a little bit distant. So um, that that's sort of, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny, actually, because I did a lot of, like, research when I was first getting into recording, like back in 97 when you know, a computer was a tenth of the speed of your iPhone. And um, I, I I used to read, like, um, you know, a lot of the magazines, like uh, Audio Technology, and even um, there was a lot of stuff in Australian Musician back then as well that just had little bits of, like, I remember this one article I found that was, uh, it was about Tommy Emanuel's album Can't Get Enough. Right where he had all the guests on it, like Robin Ford. And there was just, I, I remember the article, I can't remember the specifics of it, but it talked about what Robin brought into the studio. Like he brought a deluxe reverb that was modded by Dumble and what mic they put on it. And so there were just all these little bits I could find back then just to help me, you know, learn and curate it. So, yeah, that was all pretty cool. Is there a track on the album that's closer to your heart than others? Um... They're all, yeah, it's because it was all written pretty much about that journey last year of like moving to the US and all those little bits and pieces. They're all pretty close. Um, Leaving is a pretty special one. It, it, I released that as a single last week um, and I've um, I've been playing out a bit longer. I wrote that before I went to the US and it's always been pretty special and um, to play live takes off, but the recording came together like just unbelievably you know like the guys just nailed all the because fairly dynamic it's slow in six eight um they really nailed that sound and um the guitar sound i ended up pulling second time around on it was just beautiful as well like i i listened back to it and go oh yeah that's that's good that's me yeah, yeah. so yeah. once this pandemic is over uh mm. what's on the to-do list Oh, look, I am so keen to play with people. <laughs> I'm actually, you know, I, I haven't, uh, I've managed to do two shows, like sort of through j- early July, I think I did them, um, but they were solo and um, there is the hope that I'm going to actually record some videos with my uh, regular like Newcastle based trio this week, but we'll just have to see how things pan out here as well, but you know, um, yeah, I, I don't really have any grand plans. I think making plans now is really difficult from any point of view. But, you know, I just really want to be able to play and create music with other people and, you know, and share that with people in real life. That's, you know, I think that's all anyone really wants to do soon. Yeah. Uh, Adam Miller, uh, it was great to catch up with you. Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. Talk to you soon.